Have you ever heard of the Ombudsman? Perhaps none of you have ever heard the word Ombudsman, let alone know why he exists or what he does. But there's a real need for him, and I hope you'll soon understand why. I mean, have you ever been in a situation where you feel you've been unfairly treated and wish there was someone to complain to? Take this case, for example. Here's a woman who's parked here, she comes out and finds she's got a parking ticket. She goes up to the officer and asks what she's done wrong. The officer looks up and says she's broken the law by parking in a no parking area. But the woman points out there are no signs saying this, and the parking officer points to a sign in the middle of the street, but hidden by a tree, and tells the lady that if she's not satisfied, she's to tell it to a court. Hmm. Bit nasty, don't you think? The other day I was talking to a neighbour, and he showed me a water rates bill he'd got for a thousand dollars in excess water rates. Nobody could use that much water in a year. He complained to the water board, but got nowhere. Shouldn't there be someone to complain to? Nobody's going to pay a bill like that. There has to be someone to help. But what about this one? I caught a taxi the other day. The driver and I got talking about how hot it was, and he told me how he'd spent $400 on air conditioning for the comfort of himself and his passengers. And the TRB told him he had to take it out again. Don't you think that's a bit rough? He rang them up, but they told him it was a regulation and he would have to comply with it. It was an unreasonable demand, and surely someone can help him. There's one a teacher told me about. A pupil of hers said he went to a station to catch a train to the city. There was no staff on duty to buy a ticket from. So he caught the train with the intention of buying the ticket at the other end. He was stopped by a ticket officer who wouldn't believe his story and took his name and address. His father got a letter from the railways and a demand for ten dollars. Surely he should be able to have this investigated by an independent person. What? There is someone each of these people can appeal to. That person is the ombudsman. Ombudsman is a Swedish word which means representative. For the origins of the ombudsman, we have to go right back to the time of the Romans, around 800 BC. There they had censors who supervised the performance of officials and heard complaints of maladministration against them. But the first ombudsman, as we know him, was not appointed until 1809 in Sweden. Then Finland followed 110 years later in 1919, and Denmark in 1955. Today, there are ombudsmen in countries all over the world, as far removed as Great Britain, Israel, India, Tanzania, and the United States. In Australia, each state and the Commonwealth have an ombudsman. The Victorian Ombudsman was established by an Act of Parliament in 1973. This Act empowered the Ombudsman to receive complaints from the citizens of Victoria concerning administrative actions taken in government departments, public statutory bodies, or by officers and employees of municipalities to find the facts of those complaints and to express opinions about whether the complaints were contrary to the law unjust or unreasonable. The Ombudsman is assisted by investigation officers who have qualifications in law, accounting, engineering and other areas. Each case is investigated after a written complaint has been made and after all attempts at conciliation between the parties has been rejected. This is Mr. Rule, one of the investigation officers. He's currently working on case number 96130. Dear Sir, 
I wish you to investigate what I feel is a miscarriage of justice. I believe that the police may have acted on the premise that in an accident between an experienced motor car driver in his 50s and a young motorcyclist that the motorist must be in the right. My husband, Brian, was involved in an accident on the way home from work on his motorcycle in March last year. A car coming out of a street with a stop sign on the corner ran into my husband's motorbike. Brian was thrown from the bike and was killed. In December, the coroner returned a verdict of death by misadventure. The stipendiary magistrate of the Cricklewood Court found that the driver of the car, a Mr Jackson, was 80% to blame for the accident and awarded damages for negligence against him. My husband and I were both enthusiastic and experienced motorcyclists and we both had many years experience as members of the Cricklewood Motorcycle Club. I am concerned that, although the accident happened last year, the police have not yet prosecuted Mr Jackson for dangerous driving, and I wish you to look into the matter. Yours sincerely, Mary Robinson. The investigator's first job was to seek out the police files on the case. They showed that there were three independent witnesses to the accident, a Mr Cheek, a Mrs Crouch and a Mr Hart. Mrs. Crouch saw the car pull up at the corner. David Cheek, a student of Cricklewood High School who was walking home from school, saw a motorcycle coming towards him. It was going about 80 kilometres per hour. A vacuum cleaner salesman, Mr Hart, was getting into his car when he saw this motorbike heading towards him. What caught his attention was the noise it made as it was accelerating. There was no evidence in the file to indicate that Mr Jackson was driving dangerously at the time of the accident. A brief of evidence against Mr. Jackson for failing to give way at a stop sign was prepared, but prosecution wasn't authorised. Inspector R.G. Dobbs, the prosecution officer of T District, described the accident in these terms. Two of the witnesses said that the motorbike was travelling fast. Both of them would have watched the motorcycle for about 100 metres, which is long enough to estimate its speed. There's a stop sign at the corner of Pine Crescent. Mr. Jackson drove up to the corner and stopped at this sign. Then moved forward and became stationary again. He was still in this position when the motorcycle ran into him. Inspector Dobbs said, in his opinion, the speed of the deceased contributed to the accident. Neither witness saw any brake lights come on and there were no skid marks. It's possible that the bike rider did not see the car. For these reasons, he did not authorise the brief against Mr Jackson. The Ombudsman invited Mrs Robinson for an interview to tell her what he'd found and to see if there was any more she could tell him to change his mind. But as nothing occurred in the course of this interview that caused him to vary his conclusion, the complaint could not be made out. Mr Dillon, if 
complainant is unhappy about the result of his complaint, what further avenues are open to him? Well, uh, none, really. You see, the, com the Ombudsman is the place of last resort. Before I investigate a complaint, I have already told the complainant to take his complaint to the department if he hasn't already been there. My experience being, of course, that if a complainant takes his complaint to the department, it might well be rectified. I tell him that if, having done that, you remain aggrieved, then come back to me. So if his complaint, having been fully investigated by me, fails, then uh, he really has no other resort because he would have exhausted all of his avenues before he came to me. It is possible, however, uh, for the uh, complainant to ask me to reopen his case on the grounds that he has fresh evidence. And uh, this is quite commonplace. I do this quite uh, regularly. Uh, one of the uh, grounds upon which I may refuse to entertain a complaint is if I categorise it as trivial. I'm loath to do this, of course, because no complainant likes to be told that the Ombudsman has branded his complaint as trivial. Minor it may be, but surely never trivial. I had a prisoner some months ago who, uh, whose complaint to me was that uh, certain of his property had been uh, unlawfully converted uh, by a prison officer. The property which he described was uh, half a packet of indigestion tablets. And uh, I simply branded that as trivial, and uh, that's all there was to it. The uh, complainer well remember, and I had no hesitation in describing as trivial, was that of a prisoner at a country prison who was disciplined because he failed to uh, answer the roll call. Practice being that when the siren sounds, if you're out of the jail, you immediately return. His defence was that he didn't hear the siren. He was playing golf at the time, and uh, he was uh, looking for his lost golf ball. When he was recaptured in Melbourne, he claimed he was still looking for the golf ball. So uh, you get a variety of complaints, but in any serious complaint, if a complainant remains aggrieved, then I'm prepared to reopen his case, given the proper grounds. Has the nature of complaints changed since the inception of your office? I don't think so. I just checked my figures and I, I noticed that uh, in the case of prisoners who are by far the largest segment of complainants, in 1975, which is the completion of my first full year, I had received 614 complaints from prisoners. That's 34% of the total. Last year, the total was 412, uh, 20% of the total. Police had received 145 complaints in 1975, or 8% of the total. And last year, 129, or 5%. Education, yes, education complaints have grown quite a pace. In 75, I'd received 100 complaints, a little over 5%. In last year, two, what, 166, being a total of 8%. Local government, of course, has uh, been a new factor. I came into that jurisdiction just two years ago. Complaints from the local government average around about 15 or 16%. But it's true to say that the nature of the complaints generally has remained unchanged, although the emphasis varies with the passage of time. Do you feel that you're reaching all sections of the community, or is there a danger that only the well-informed may be serviced? Well, my records indicate that I'm reaching all sections of the community, although not necessarily every one in every section of the community. For example, I have checked my uh, statistics and I receive more complaints pro rata from the country than I do from the city. And I never cease to be amazed at some of the out of the way uh, addresses from which complainants write. And I ask myself, how did you ever hear of the Ombudsman? But they continue to write. As uh, one section of community that I'm interested in, particularly the migrant section, I'm often asked, do they use the office of the Ombudsman? 
Well, I think that section pleasures the office quite uh, significantly. Listen, I want you out of there right now. Come on, get out now. Huh? Oh. What's that? Well, hurry up about it, will you? Sorry. Listen, just what the hell do you think you're doing there? What? Well, whose land do you reckon it is? Well, don't you know, what do you think this is, a public camping ground or something? I don't know. This is my land, lady. Look, I want you out of here straight away. Oh, jeez, you've got some cheap fed. And another thing I want to know is about this dog here. What about him? Well, how long's he been there? All night. Yeah, all night. You sure about that? Well, he can't unlock the door, can he? No. Oh, look, I'm sympathetic in your arguments anymore. You've got ten minutes, and then off. Now. Get to it. Go on. A big problem which occurs in most parts of the country where there are mixtures of farms and towns is dog attacks on sheep. It's more prevalent than most people are aware. Dear sir, I am the owner of Riverview Sheep Stud. The location map is enclosed. Over the past few years, I have been involved in a continuing battle with the Harrison Shire Council over dog attacks on my sheep. The cooperation from the council has been far from good, and I have lost many sheep with little action being taken to curb these attacks. Last August, the bylaws officer of the council asked me to advise him when I shot any dog wearing a registration tag that was attacking my sheep, as he would come out, take photographs and prosecute the owner. At approximately 11pm on Tuesday, December the 16th, I shot such a dog, which was attacking my sheep. I phoned the bylaws officer and asked him would the Shire prosecute the owner of the dog I had just shot, and he refused to do so. Your sincerely, John Dyer. Mr. Dyer's complaint in this case was not so much about the actual dog attacks, but about the fact that the council was not prepared to take steps to prevent the attacks, for instance, by prosecuting the owners of registered pets who came from the towns to the farms to attack his sheep. After the ombudsman had obtained the initial comment from the Shire Secretary about the complainant's letter, Mr. Rule visited the bylaws officer, Mr. Bowen. Yes, come in. G'day, Greg Rule from the Ombudsman's Office. Max Bowen, sit down, Greg. Thanks, Mr Bowen. Uh, as you probably know, we're investigating the reports of uh, dog attacks on sheep in the area, and I'd just like to get some background information from you, if I could. Um, well, first off, uh, how do you account for Mr Dyer's claim of frequent attacks on his sheep? Look, they're totally unfounded. Uh, I've patrolled the area, and there are no dogs outside the yard. I've never seen one, they're never on the road. We have no problems with dogs at all. Dyer is a complainer. Well, 
When uh, Mr. Dyer's sheep were killed, did he, did he ring you at all? Yes, he uh, said he'd had mauled sheep and I went into the area. Did you see those sheep which were mauled? No, I wasn't invited. I patrolled the area. I visited those properties which had German shepherds. Mr. Dyer has uh, a German shepherd dog registered. In fact, I think he's got two. I've seen them around his place on several occasions. Now, you do consider that you have to be invited in even after Mr. Dyer has rung and complained about... Mr. Dyer never invited me onto the property. I was never asked. As I make it a policy that I only go on onto a property if I'm invited. Uh -huh. How much of your time approximately is spent concerned with dogs, Mr. Bowen? Well, I don't personally uh, go out. Uh, Mr. Bailey and two men from the depot go out on a Monday... Monday between 8 and 12, uh, they go to the shopping areas and the local schools. So Monday's your only regular day for dog patrol? Yes, uh, unless it's pouring with rain or the chaps don't turn up, uh, that sort of thing. Yeah. Okay, so if that happens, if something like that happens, uh, do you go out the next day or does that patrol go by the board until next week? We leave it till the following Monday, yes. Yeah, right. There's no um, after-hours patrols at all? No uh, patrols at night? No. All right. What about uh, Christmas and uh, school holiday periods? Do you put on extra patrols then at all? That's a, that's a very busy time of the year, um, checking out the foreshore camping area, food stalls, littering, that sort of thing. Mm. So we don't have time for that. We do make a point, though, however, that uh, visitors, especially visitors, uh, we tell them to keep their dogs on a leash. Mm -hmm. Two days later, Mr. Rule paid a visit to Mr. Dyer, the farmer. First of all, um, are your, all your boundary fences the same as the ones at the front gate? Yeah. Uh, netting, barbed wire? Yeah, yeah, you've got your, your netting or your mesh wire over the top of five wires going uh, horizontally. And then you've got barbed wire over the top of that. Well, that goes around the outer boundaries of the whole place. Right. Um, and what exactly have you taken, what sort of action have you taken yourself concerning dogs uh, by way of preventative action or legal action? Yeah, well, between the old man and myself, we've been, we've been shooting dogs here for about 16 years, I reckon. And uh, oh, I'm always out with a sheep. I never get, enough, never get any time to do anything else, actually. Uh, legal action, yeah, well, no, we haven't taken any legal action. Well, who told you that you couldn't take any? Our family solicitor. Well, actually, he said uh, we could seek council opinion or whatever, but he seemed to be saying at the same time that it wouldn't do us any good. Mm. Now, can you tell me what the last, uh, last instances of attacks were, the most recent ones, say? Yeah. Um, well, we had a real bad one at the end of last year. It was, it was the 27th of December. And on that occasion, we lost about, we lost 23 sheep in the one night. Uh, then just after the start of the new year, January the 3rd, another two got killed. How can you be so exact with your times? The reason why is, I mean, you just don't tend to forget the, the times and dates when you lose about 23 sheep. Or some nights, when it's not so windy as it is now, uh, I sleep with the window open and uh, I can hear the barking from there. Well, then I can, you know, race out with my gun. But uh, other nights, when it is windy and I wouldn't be able to hear from up there, I take the ute out and sleep in among the sheep. And the sheep are so full of fear that, uh, well, they're, they're crunching up against the, the side of the door. Right. Now, you've spoken to Mr Bowen, the bylaws officer, and Mr Bailey, you've seen him. Yeah. Um, now, in those in instances when you reported uh, sheep being killed or mauled to those yeah. officers, did either of them come and visit you at all, see the... No, no, they just weren't interested. Well, they said that whilst they agreed to make inquiries, uh, they were not invited to visit your property to see the damage. Well, I, did, I didn't send them a card with an invitation on it, if, that, if that's what you're saying. But uh, the point is, they're most welcome. You did expect a visit? No, I didn't, not from experience. What dogs have you owned yourself in the last 12 months? Uh, well, at the moment, we've got, a, we've got a Kelpie and her pup, Kelpie Bitch. Have you ever owned or kept a German Shepherd on the property or had friends here? No, with no, no way, no. We never, we, all we've had is just kelpies for running and, and rounding up the sheep. That's all we've ever had here.
The next point of call was Dr. Young, the local veterinarian. Craig Rill from the Ombudsman's office. Uh, Dr. Young, is there in your view a problem with wandering dogs in the area? Oh yes, Mr. Rill, there certainly is. I've even attended a cow near Mr. Dyer's property owned by his neighbour which had been badly mauled. And again on last Friday I attended to a badly mauled sheep and it had been dogged. In actual fact, one farmer in the district had his Cheviot sheep dogged in a continuing process over the last several years. And another farmer, well, his flock was around about 700 and now it's been reduced to 400. And dogs and weekend people are responsible. Why is it that the Shire denies receiving any great number of complaints? Oh, I don't think the Shire's really aware of the problem. I've tried to bring it home to them, but nothing's been done. Right. Thanks very much, Dr. Young. Um, in passing uh, Mr. Dyer's property, have you ever seen an Alsatian dog uh, around the place? No, never. No. Thank you very much. Thank you. After visiting the district veterinarian officer in the Department of Agriculture, Mr. Rule visited Mr. Drewer, a district inspector, for a final opinion. Mr. Drewer? Yeah. Oh, g'day, how are g'day. you? G'day, how are you? Greg Rule from the Ombudsman. Oh, how do you do? How are you? Yeah. Um, well, are you aware of a problem with dogs in the area? Yes, yes, there is one actually. Yeah. Well, apart from Mr. Dyer, who I believe you've... Uh, you know about. Mm. Uh, are there any other farmers who have suffered severe stock loss through uh, continuous dog attacks on their stock? Well, well yes. Uh, there's Fred Giles who's one or two miles east of Dyer. His property normally runs about 800 uh, head of sheep normally, but he says he's lost about 120 in the last 12 months. As a matter of fact, uh, when was it? January, the uh, January holiday weekend, he said he lost 10. And at that time he found a stud Afghan hound amongst them as well as another dog which he shot. Do you know whether, uh, whether he reported this to the Shire or not? No, look, I don't know really. What I, as far as I do know, he, he shoots the dogs. Yeah. The Ombudsman found that a complaint by Mr. Dyer had been established. He recommended that the practices and duties allocated to bylaw officers in relation to the administration and enforcement of the Dog Act be changed so that there could be no future complaints from Mr. Dyer or other farmers in relation to this problem. The Shire conceded that it had misjudged the severity and effect of the dog problem within the Shire and advised the Ombudsman of action which would be taken in the future. As the Shire was prepared to instigate proper measures towards control, the case was closed. The Ombudsman, it seems, has only power to recommend. How much does restraint does this put on the effectiveness of your office? I mean, would you prefer to have a greater power of direction? No, I wouldn't. For two reasons. Uh, first, I don't think it's necessary. And secondly, if I had power of direction, whereas, as I'll indicate in a few moments, departments unhesitatingly accept my recommendations, whilst they will accept opinions and recommendations, they'd be very slow to accept direction. And if the Ombudsman had power to direct, it's a certainty that the departments and the public authorities would demand the right of appeal to some form of administrative appeals tribunal, some check uh, feeling that this direction of the Ombudsman is wrong. As it is, in the six and a half years I've been here, I have made many suggestions and uh, expressed many opinions. It has only been necessary for me to make 104 formal recommendations. And of the 104 formal recommendations I've made, 101 have been implemented. The remaining three, the two uh, it was found were incapable of being implemented, particular reasons, and one lapsed because of the inaction by the complainant. Now with a record of acceptance of recommendations like that, I think it can be fairly stated that it's unnecessary for the Ombudsman to have power of direction. Have there been any pressures to restrict the role of the Ombudsman? Well, in the early days, yes. There were quite considerable pressures. Back in late 73 and early 74, 
to Bath and Joe, finding it difficult to come to grips with this new office. And uh, Prince of the uh, Parole Board took a very poor view of the Ombudsman. They've been investigating each jurisdiction to investigate their decisions. And so the Parliament passed an amending statute limiting my jurisdiction uh, to investigate any complaints which uh, arose out of some action by a uh, board presided over by a judge, magistrate or legally qualified person. And uh, that legislation was passed within the first 12 months of my appointment. But no such legislation has been introduced since and I think that uh, departments generally have come to accept the uh, Ombudsman. How would you suggest that the public should assess the value of the Ombudsman? I would assess the value of the office this way. That if I had a complaint and uh, I could not get satisfaction, no matter to what source I went, I would feel that I was entitled to demand a Royal Commission, a Board of Inquiry, into my complaint against this government department. And of course I wouldn't get off the ground getting the government to appoint a Royal Commission to my particular complaint. Unless, of course, that complaint was one of, uh, one might say, national status, one so far-reaching that it demanded the appointment of a Royal Commission. But today, with the Ombudsman's office in being and available, it means that every man, woman and child in this state, by simply writing a letter to the Ombudsman, is in fact inviting the Ombudsman to set himself up as a Board of Inquiry, as a Royal Commission, to investigate his complaint. Because I have all the powers of a Board of Inquiry. I can subpoena files, subpoena witnesses, demand that witnesses answer my questions. So when that letter is written off to the Ombudsman, it is true that it may well result in the Ombudsman formally constituting himself as a Board of Inquiry to investigate that complaint. What in fact it might turn out to be that the Ombudsman will pick up the telephone and clear the blockage and adjust the grievance with a simple telephone call so that a complaint when it's addressed to the Ombudsman could be rectified as simply as make the phone call or as complicated and as complex as having a six or nine months investigation and inquiry. And I believe that if the people of Victoria assess and understand the office of the Ombudsman as being just that that there is available at all times a man who's most accessible, who's established the independence and the impartiality of the office, who's demonstrated that his decisions or his recommendations have proved to be acceptable to departments and that his office on the facts proved to be acceptable to the public, that this is a very worthwhile public office. Thank you, Mr. Dillon. I wrote a letter to the council but I wasn't satisfied there because I still had to pay my fine. So I took the matter up with the Ombudsman and they found that I was right, that they, there were, the signs were hidden behind the trees and um, they later on, they actually refunded my fine and um, they put signs in front of the trees. I got onto the water board, but I didn't seem to get anywhere with them, so I contacted the Ombudsman he carried out investigations into the matter and he found out that there could have been four possibilities as to what could have caused the problem. And he decided in the end that the actual problem was that I had uh, been billed for water I hadn't used rather than I had because the water meter had actually been connected the wrong way around. The water board uh, then decided to waive all my bills. Oh, uh, well, I went to get it checked, as you normally do from the TRB, and they just told me to get rid of it. So, well, I wasn't going to stand for that. So I went to the Ombudsman, and uh, on their studies, and they said, oh, well, I've dropped the wrong one in. Otherwise, it would have been passed. So now I've got to go back to the flipping retailer again and get the right one. What, what, what's, the, what's the right one? Well, the right one's one where you can fit in the glove box where it uh, won't be in the danger of the public, you see, because if you're hanging down under the dashboard, uh, they're likely to hurt their legs on them. So, uh, under the regulations, that's what we've got to do. 
Well, after getting nowhere with the railways, I decided to contact the uh, ombudsman, who uh, took over the case and contacted the railway commission. They got a letter back to say that uh, there had definitely been somebody on duty at the time. My son uh, took the train into Melbourne. So, uh, well, there's really no case. I believe my son, and I, I did right from the start. I still do. Anyone who feels he has a legitimate complaint against a government authority or department or municipal council or the police should contact the ombudsman. This contact should preferably be made in writing, setting out all the relevant details, or initially, the contact can be made by phone. It's all right to have the letter written by a solicitor or a friend, as long as the letter is authorised by the complainant. The ombudsman suggests that if you do have a legitimate complaint against any of these bodies, you ought to take steps to rectify the matter yourself. If, however, you find you're getting nowhere, don't desist. Contact the ombudsman.